So welcome everyone. And Monica was just saying um, how, what a delightful journey this is um, of going through these different, uh, with theosophy as a backdrop, right? Uh, with um, exploring these different traditions and their meanings. Let me get, uh -huh. comes Maria, there she is. And, um, oh, you're doing that right, Susan? So, and so this week in the Aquarian Almanac series, we are um, we'll be, uh, learning about from Kurt Folkent, Rama Avatar. And the Hermes quote for this week is the sacred lineage and divine descent of Rama, the king instructor, exalts the sacrificial light of self-consciousness, the luster of truth in action. And next week in our journey um, is we will be learning about something from Shakespeare. Uh, there is a kind of a reference or a line that says from Puck to Pros Prospero about all the different roles that I suppose we can take in our various reincarnations. And um, last week we uh, learned from uh, Isabel Fernandez about uh, Islam and surrender. And she really thought that through and that was very much appreciated and very helpful to us. So um, just if anybody would like to participate, we're gonna start uh, sharing the announcements of these on universaltheosophy.com. Um, and, and that way, um, probably even more people, I suppose, will come. And, um, and also our meetings on Sunday mornings at 1030 on the Secret Doctrine. It, hopefully it's not intimidating. A lot of people will not come to a Secret Doctrine class because they think it'll be intimidating. But hopefully the way we do it, it's not. And um, because nobody pretends that they're some kind of an advanced student. And anybody who does pretend that they're an advanced student in that probably isn't. But, um, and then also uh, on Friday afternoons, we have a, kind of a small study circle on the Bhagavad Gita. And that gets into kind of more of the heart doctrine and so forth, but all are welcome. So Kurt, without uh, further ado, uh, let's, let's go to India. Here we go. So welcome, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, as I was telling Jonathan, I already kind of did some some teaching today on um, some of these related topics on to some uh, yoga teacher training students. Um, so I've already kind of been around the Murti world a little bit and, and gave some of the Vedanta. And so I'm going to go ahead and um, bring us in to. All right, hold on a second. As usual, I'm trying to go to share my screen, but I don't see it doing the presentation. So I think I pushed the wrong button. Um, there we go. All right. So hopefully you all can see my screen. I see a nod, so that's good. <laughs> all right. So today I'm gonna to take us on a little bit of a journey. Um, we are going to talk about Rama and who Rama is. And the, to really understand that we have to go deeper than just talking about Rama. We have to then talk about Vishnu. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and do a little bit of that. Um, I'm actually gonna take us into what I call an intermission where we're going to do a very brief uh, meditation and mantra practice. Um, to kind of explore for those that aren't familiar with any of those practices, just what that might look like to incorporate into our lives. And then um, following that, we're going to go into this idea of Dharma, right? Because when you study Rama, you really don't get as much out of it unless you really understand Dharma, because that is the, the essence of why Rama is so beloved um, throughout India, as Jonathan was mentioning. It's, it's this principle, this um, property really of dharma and we'll kind of finish up um, depending on time we will then take a look at duty right and explore some other 
ideas around this. So dharma not just dhar, dharma kind of means duty. We'll get into that a little bit, but um, there's other aspects to it as well. And so I'm going to kind of take us on this little journey here, and we'll kind of see where we go. So to begin, part one, Rama. But like I said, to talk about Rama, we need to talk about Vishnu. And so Vishnu, as many of us might be familiar with, is one of the three primary um, Hindu gods, with Brahma and Shiva being the other two. Brahma is notorious for being noted as the creator. Vishnu is notorious for being the sustainer. And Shiva is notorious for being the destroyer. Now, without going into the nuances of all of that, we're just going to stick with Vishnu for now. Um, I liked this image right here because this is showing all 10 incarnations or avatars, right, as we might otherwise call them, of Vishnu. Now, one of the things that I have done to this is, is put the numbers next to the, the picture so you can kind of see what's going on here. But under those, if you look at one, two, three, four, and five, the first five incarnations of Vishnu were these um, half man, half animal incarnations, right? So in a sense, we could look at the first five incarnations of Vishnu as lower um, animal instinct, lower egoic instinct, right? And then once he goes into his sixth through 10th incarnations, that's where he starts to become fully embodied in, in a human body. And where we start to see this evolution of from incarnation to incarnation of absorbing these higher self aspects of Vishnu's immensity, right? Um, so we are going to really kind of focus just on Rama, but also I do want to touch on as we talk about um, in this Aquarian Almanac series, we have this Janus aspect of looking backwards and looking forwards. So again, without, to try to understand Rama, we should look at Rama in the evolution of Vishnu. And so we're going to look at Parasurama, we're going to look at Balarama, we're going to look at Krishna. And we won't look at Buddha specifically, but I am going to go ahead and touch on that towards the end, right? Because Buddha is an incarnation of Vishnu. And so I really tried to, to tailor this presentation to all of those aspects of Vishnu and Buddha and duty and Dharma and Hinduism and Vedanta and theosophy and Zen Buddhism and a lot of different things are going to be in this presentation. So um, that's where we're going to go ahead and go on this journey. Oh, and now it doesn't want to move to the next screen. There we go. So if we look backward, in other words, before Rama's incarnation, we have this incarnation of Parasurama. He is the sixth incarnation of Vishnu, and he is said to be Rama with a battle axe. And so here's a picture of him and a lot of death and destruction as he's running around swinging this mighty axe, right? Parasurama was the son of a sage couple, a royal couple. He had a royal um, mother and a Brahmin father, right? So this is where his lineage comes from. Um, he, he basically incarnated, so to speak, to teach a lesson to this arrogant Kshatriya class that was oppressing the people. And so what he did is he went around, what you see here in this image, right, is killing all of these Kshatriyas that weren't living Dharma. They were allowing this lower ego aspect of themselves to control and to oppress. And so he went ahead and kind of took care of that, you know what I mean, by smiting them. Um, you'll notice in a lot of these stories about um, incarnations of Vishnu, much of these incarnations come from the people or other devas um, begging for help, for support because of evils that are going on. And so Vishnu incarnates to go ahead and help to um, bring balance to that and kind of bring it back to order, right? To sustain order. Um, so that's what kind of what you picture here in this image is Parashurama doing his dharma, his duty, right? To go ahead and, and destroy these oppressive um, warrior class people. Now, there's a story. The interesting thing about Parashurama is normally when we think of in, uh, incarnations or avatars, we as humans like to think linearly, right? This happened and then this happened and then this happened and then this happened. Well, Parashurama is here, but Parashurama, an incarnation of Vishnu, meets Rama, an incarnation of Vishnu, according to the stories, right? They're alive at the same time. And so in the story of the Ramayana, Parashurama gets all upset because of how Sita and Rama are getting married and he goes to throw a fit and Rama basically disarms him by taking some of his powers and with a finger, he, he unstrings his bow, 
right? And at that point, Paris Rama says, okay, Ram, you could do whatever you want, right? Sorry, my bad. Sorry for interrupting your wedding. You know, you go ahead and move forward. So these are these interesting aspects of how, I know that from a theosophy perspective, I don't want to say I know, I have heard from a theosophical, theosophical perspective that many theosophists don't like this idea of incarnations and avatars because it, it takes the personal responsibility out of things and it makes humans kind of look at these savior beings. But if we look at this just from a perspective of um, what we can learn from them, right? What we can learn from these stories and what we can learn from these incarnations uh, or these avatars, right? I think that's where the real power of this is. Um, so another interesting thing about Parashurama is while he was alive for Rama, again, according to the, the stories, right, the lineage, um, he was also alive when Krishna was alive. He was a teacher to Karna. And in the Mahabharata, Karna is Arjuna's kind of mortal enemy, right? They are both claiming to be the best, greatest warriors that were ever alive at that time, right? And Parashurama teaches Karna everything that he knows. Karma is a very, Karna, sorry, is a very dedicated student of Parashurama. And there's another story related to this. And again, I'm having to do the brief, brief stories because of everything we have to get through. But there's a story of um, Parashurama resting his head on Karna's thigh to get, a, to get some rest. And a snake comes over and bites Karna on the leg, but Karna will not move. He does not want to disturb his master. So he does everything in his power to go ahead and allow the poison to seep in without disturbing his master. So Parasurama wakes up and realizes what's going on. And in that, that exchange, again, not going into too much detail, but in that exchange, Parasurama finds out that Karna is not who he said he was, that, that ultimately Parasurama feels that he's been lied to. And so he says to him, because I can't unteach you what I've taught you, but what I am going to do is curse you with a curse that says in the time of your greatest need, you will forget the deadliest weapon technique that I told you. And in the Mahabharata then, when Arjuna is fighting Karna, in that moment that Karna needs that technique, he forgets it and Arjuna kills him, right? And so these are these kinds of things, again, from an incarnation perspective and from a story perspective, there's a lot that we can learn by just kind of thinking about morality and thinking about our word and you know how we, what our vak means, what our voice means, right? Um, how, we, how we make oaths and do we keep them or not? So he's this first human incarnation. He's often thought of as kind of the weakest incarnation. But again, if you look at it kind of as an evolutionary standpoint, that might make a little bit of sense because he's coming from these lower aspects to these higher aspects. So then we're going to go and move skip Rama for a minute. And now we're going to go what came after Rama. And this is where it's kind of interesting again, because when you're looking at these incarnations of Vishnu, depending on where in India and what lineage and you know, who's kind of thinking about these things, Balarama might be the eighth incarnation, Krishna might be the eighth incarnation, but here's another kind of strange aspect to the story, which is Balarama or Rama the strong is the elder brother of Krishna. So now you've got an aspect of Vishnu at the same time as an aspect of Vishnu, right? At the same time in the same family, you know? Um, and so there's another story here where Balarama is basically drinking, he's getting drunk and he's hanging out with a bunch of ladies and um, the Vivida comes along and he's upset, he's a monkey and he's very upset that his friend was killed and he's, he's basically becoming a menace, right? And he's going around and he's burning villages and he's kind of tormenting the people. And so this, this uh, monkey comes along with, or comes across Balarama who's, just trying to enjoy his day with a little bit of drink and a little bit of company. And they end up fighting and Balarama kills him. Again, this is the short, short version. There's obviously way more to it than that. But um, there was an aspect of this story that I found interesting, which is when Balarama first sees the Vivida coming and, and causing problems, he, he has arrogance, right? And he's like, oh, I could go ahead and take this guy with no, no problem, right? This is just some silly little monkey causing problems, causing mischief, you know, I got, I got this. And he ended up having quite a battle for a while, right? Because he would throw something and the monkey would get out of the way and the monkey would throw something back and hit him in the head. And so he was getting more, he was experiencing these human emotions of, of anger and those kinds of things because he wanted this, he thought he should be able to just end it quickly. So um, as you can see here in this picture where we, we talk a lot about these weapons, right? He's actually holding a plow as his weapon. 
And from what I researched, there are aspects to Balarama that might suggest that he was really kind of an agricultural hero that got elevated to an incarnation of Vishnu, right? Um, but regardless of that, um, this is who he is or, or what the stories kind of tell us. And this last little bullet point here I found really interesting, which is when Balarama died and he left this mortal frame of his, there are stories that talk about Sesha, which is an aspect of Ananta, which is the, the snake on which Vishnu resides, that that came from his mouth. And so these are those kinds of things where that's where I think a lot of the, the debate, if you will, comes from is Balarama an incarnation of Vishnu or not? Because some people take it that because Sesha came from his mouth, that means he was an actual incarnation of Sesha versus Vishnu. But because Vishnu was reclining on, on Ananta, on Sesha, right? That there, that's where a lot of this, um, these cross stories kind of happen. But I wanted to bring this to people's awareness just so it, I can expand the, the view on which um, the Hindu culture, right? The Vedic culture, the, the Puranas and all these stories kind of blend together to teach these lessons. So now the other eighth incarnation is the one that many of us are more familiar with, but lots of us are only familiar with this eighth incarnation of Vishnu, which is Krishna, because of our study of the Gita, because that is really where theosophy comes into play as the study of the Gita. But there's a Krishna way before we find him as a charioteer, right? And so I wanted to kind of touch upon this other personality aspect of Vishnu, of Krishna, so that we can kind of see how evolution happens within an incarnation. So, um, it, it, you know, the, 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 the teachings kind of go that Vishnu was, incar I'm sorry, Krishna was incarnated to vanquish a demon king of Kamsa. Um, he goes ahead and does that ultimately. Um, but there's an aspect of Krishna where he's playing his flute and it's just the way in which he plays it, kind of nature just love everything in nature loves it. They, we, they can't get enough of it. Nobody can get enough of it. It is melodious to the point that it's intoxicating, right? So, and that's with the flute. And there's lots of symbols that we can talk about, about what the flute is. It's a hollow, empty vessel, right? But it is the breath of life that causes this music to happen, right? Causes this beautiful sound to happen. So there's symbology in which we can take from this aspect. Um, this, this part of, of Krishna had no wives, but he had all of these Gobi devotees, right? Who kind of symbolize this love for God. But at that same time, you have this aspect, which you see here in the picture of Radha and Krishna. And Radha is the embodiment um, of the ultimate individual devotion of the individual soul to God. So much so that in certain areas of India, when you go over there, the greeting might be Radha Radha, right? Like, like the Radha in me sees the Radha in you, right? The devotee in me sees the devotee in you, right? And so they're not even talking about Krishna. They're talking about Radha in that aspect. You know, they're not referencing Krishna directly. They're doing it indirectly. And so this was another aspect of Vishnu that I kind of thought when we talk about Rama, it's good to kind of see where these incarnations where, where they came from, what came before Rama technically in this like linear timeline and what came afterwards. And so again, one last thing is then when we talk about the Krishna that's in the Mahabharata, now this Krishna was different. He had wives, he had a kingdom, right? He didn't play the flute in the Mahabharata. That was not part of, of his essence at that time. So it's almost like we have this change in who Krishna was from the stories, how, how the stories go, um, that now he's gone from you know, um, mesmerizing people and, and getting true devotion to God to people. So now he's a charioteer and he's leading. Now he's coming into this next step of his evolution or, or you know, stage where now he's guiding Arjuna, right, to self-realization. And this third bullet point here is one of the things that I want to touch on a little bit here because we're going to kind of go through the back door later, right, is this notion of the most human aspect of Vishnu. Rama is considered, and we'll get there, the perfect, the perfect human, right? Many people, many stories talk about him being perfection, but we have to talk about what that actually means. Whereas Krishna can be the most human and we will see, and I just want to bring it up now so that we can kind of think about that of, of comparing Rama and Rama's qualities 
to Krishna and Krishna's qualities. Because for those of us that have in, in even the tiniest amount studied the Mahabharata, we'll realize that Krishna was a manipulator, right? He, he made this happen. And so he, while, while the philosophy of we're all one and, you know, it's all about the self and, the, and the, what we study in the Gita is there in the Mahabharata, he's not this, you know, he's not this God, what we would call a perfect godlike figure. He has aspects to himself where he intentionally creates a scenario that will, that if he had given that option to the people he's manipulating, right, they probably would say, I don't want it that way. <laughs> you know, I'd rather you not do that. So there's this aspect that I think we, we should really kind of consider as we go through. And the last thing on here I found really interesting as I was kind of researching Krishna and Rama and Parashurama and Balarama was once Balarama had died, Krishna's older brother, there's a story of Krishna saying, you know what, I'm kind of done, right? I think I'm ready to leave this body. This, this mortal frame needs to go away. And so he decided he was going to lay down under a tree. And many of the pictures that you'll see of Krishna and of Rama and others will have the right foot picked up and kind of placed next to the left knee. But this story that I read talked about him picking up his left foot and placing it by his right knee. I don't know what that means. I, I'm not going to even pretend to go there, but I thought it was really interesting that in almost all of the images that you see, it's a right foot picked up, left foot towards the ground, right? The right foot goes towards the left knee. And in this story, it was the opposite of that. And he was getting ready to, again, leave, leave the body. And in the process of doing that, a hunter mistakes the bottom of his foot, because in this picture, you can see his palm is kind of a pinkish hue, right? He's got the blue skin, but the palm is this pinkish hue. So a hunter mistakes the reddish pinkish hue of the bottom of his foot for a deer, shoots an arrow, pierces his foot, and that's what ends up killing Krishna in that story, right? And, and again, I just found it really interesting that it was that foot, right? The other thing too, and I made sure I put this in there, is this word soul, right? Soul, not S-O-U-L, but S-O-L-E, but still the aspect of an arrow piercing a soul, right? It was just something, it was a seed I, I wanted to play with and I wanted to plant. I don't know if it means anything, but I thought it was interesting. So let me give you a summary because we, what's happening right now and why this is in the Aquarian Almanac is because of Rama Devami, right? And that is Rama's birthday. And as we will get to, it's also a day where Rama and Sita were married. But to know who Rama is and to know who Rama and Sita are and to know who, what Rama Devami is about, we kind of need to understand what the Ramayana is about. So this is the short, short, short version of a beautiful poem, a wonderful story, but I've only got about an hour and 10 minutes, right? And I got to get through a lot of stuff. So Rama is born as the king of Dasharatha, of Ayodhya, and he had three younger brothers. The youngest brother is Bharata, the oldest brother is Lakshmana, and I don't remember the middle brother's name, I apologize. Oh, there's Shobha. Shatrugna. Shatrugna. There you go. Thank you, my dear. So he's got these three, he's the eldest brother, right? And there's, there's um, multiple uh, mothers, right? Because back then, they, they, kings could have more than one bride, right? So his father had more than one bride, had, had two other, or three other brothers, sorry. Um, Rama, when he was kind of growing up and becoming a man, so to speak, he had to go ahead and, and vanquish many demons. He was asked, the, a sage asked his father, father for Rama to escort him through the jungle so that the sage could go ahead and perform his rites and his rituals. And Rama had to go ahead and vanquish many demon, demons, right, on, on his trip to do that. While he was out killing these demons so that the sage could perform these rituals, um, they come across... Uh, Sita's wedding or Sita's, I don't want to call it wedding, the betrothment, the time in which her father was saying, hey, she's ready to be married. If anybody can, you know, can win this competition, they can win Sita. And so the, the test was bending and stringing Shiva's bow. So Rama was the one that was able to go ahead and actually bend and string that bow. And Shobha, you can correct me, but I'm pretty sure he broke the bow at some point because he was so strong, he actually snapped the bow. So that, that's all going on. So now Rama and Sita are going to be wed because of this, right? So he's already killed demons. He's got these other brothers. They're all technically princes of a king. So now you've got some treachery that begins, which is the mother of the youngest brother 
has someone whispering in her ear evil thoughts, right? Um, conspiratorial, treacherous thoughts. And so his mother had been granted two boons by the king. And she used that moment to ask for those two boons, right? Which are kind of like a wish, like a genie and a wish, right? That's what a boon is. And what she asked for was not to make Rama king, even though he was the eldest and every all of the brothers thought he should be the king, right? Um, she said, please don't make Rama, or no, not even please, don't make Rama king, because these are wishes, these are boons, right? There's no asking, it's just he has to do it. Don't make Rama king and exile him for 14 years. And the king, at least being good to his word, had to abide by that. And it ultimately killed him. The sorrow in his heart for having to honor his wife's wishes, but send his kind of quote unquote most beloved son out into the forest and not give him his, his, his kingdom as was supposed to happen. This ended up killing King Dasharatha, right? So while in the forest, Sita is kidnapped by Ravana, um, a, a demon of, um, he, had, he had gained his powers by worshiping uh, Brahma so much, right? And so he got these powers that he has. So when Sita is kidnapped, Rama has to go look for her. He takes his brother Lakshman um, and goes and, and joins forces with Sugriva, who is the king of the monkeys. They, they get Hanuman. That's where Hanuman comes into the story, right? They go ahead and they rescue Sita. They have a huge battle. They kill Ravana and they all go back home. So upon returning to Ayodhya, now you know, victorious from all of the battles and all of these um, adventures, there had been some aspects along the journey, and I don't want to go too much into it, that caused some issues for Rama about his doubt for her and her chastity. So part of the story is her being asked to do this trial of fire where she goes into a fire and she doesn't burn. And so that proves that she, is ch she was chased, right? She had been proclaiming her innocence the entire time. But there were some things that happened in the story that kind of um, compelled Rama to do this. She, she survived. And so then they go and they get married. That's part of what Rama Navami is about, right? His birth and his wedding. Um, but there was still this aspect of some of the people in Ayodhya still questioned her virtue. She was gone in Ravana's, you know, prison for a very long time. I think it was 10 months or some, you know, amount of time like that. So there were people that were saying, eh, you know, she probably... She probably is not as pure as, you know, she says she is. I don't know. Maybe, you know, she, she did the trial of fire thing, but I'm not so trusting it. So um, because of Rama's duty now to be king and because he is now a king, he's not a husband per se, right? From his Dharma perspective, he's now a king. His responsibilities have shifted to a greater level. So what he does is he says, I need you to leave, right? Sita is now expelled into the forest, kind of like how he was expelled earlier. And upon her journeys, she meets Valmiki, who is actually the author of the original author of the Ramayana. She meets him, she stays with him for a while, and she gives birth to Rama's two sons. And she raises the two sons with Valmiki. She comes back then when the sons are of age to present her two sons to Rama and again say, I've been innocent, right? I am your, your humble forever wife, right? But there's so much going on that she finally says, okay, Mother Earth, that's it. Please take me away from all of this. I, I can't keep saying I'm innocent. I'm getting kind of tired of this. And again, this is the short, short version. So take it for what it's worth. But she ends up being taken into the Earth, right? Like literally the Mother Earth just encapsulates her and takes her away, never to return, right? And so this is the backdrop. All of these different stories are going on in the Ramayana, and that's what makes Rama so interesting to study is because of all of these aspects that are going on. So let's do a little bit more on the Ramayana. I'm just going to kind of go through this quickly. Um, these are quotes that I found online. It's just if there's one book that has so many people in India, they had a TV show based on this, and it would, on a weekly basis, the whole country would just stop what they were doing. Industry would shut down. This, these are the stories that I've been told, right? By, by Manoj and, and Jyoti who were there, right? That it was like the, the country just shut down for the hour that this TV show was on, right? So this is a very important um, story to the Indian people. There is no aspect of their culture, of their religion, of their music and art and everything else that has been unaffected by 
the archetypes, by these stories, because this was such a, a, a moving story. There's so much in it. Um, there is so much of morality embedded in this story itself on many, many levels, speaking one's truth and, and holding to their word, forgiving your enemies, um, you know, lo lots of lots of lots of different things. Um, so one of the things that this last little thing on here is the reminder is that great men keep their promises at all costs, good sons obey their parents and noble wives cheerfully share in the karma of their spouses. These are the types of underlying structures that have guided um, Indian culture for so long because of the way that this story unfolds. Um, this is a classic uh, story about Dharma, and we'll get into the definition of that, versus a Dharma, of Devas versus Asuras, good versus evil. And the epitome of that is this battle between Rama and Ravana. And we don't, I'm not going to touch too much on that um, other than it's just kind of the, you know, from our modern nomenclature, it's the ultimate good versus evil, you know, type of, type of battle. The second bullet was what I wanted to address with the Krishna thing earlier, is he's believed by many to be the greatest, the most ideal human being that has ever lived, right? And so let's explore that a little bit as we listen to um, and think about who Rama is, right? Let's consider that and juxtapose that against Krishna and try to understand what it means to be the ideal human being. Um, and then, like I said, the, the story of the Ramayana ultimately is just how to live a virtuous dharmic life, right? That's really the essence of this story. So uh, in about, I wanna say four days, Shobha, you might know the actual date, I'm not sure, but Rama Navama, Rama Navami is coming up soon. Um, the, the 21st, I think. This time. There you go. Yeah, I, I thought it might be three or four days away. So it's coming up soon. So this will be a big celebration, right? Um, the second bullet point on here is Rama is considered to be an aspect of Vishnu that has half the divine qualities of Lord Vishnu. Now, this is the this is the the third piece that I really wanted to focus on when we start to contemplate ideal human being. That if Rama has half of the qualities and Krishna perhaps has all of the qualities, then let's look at what that ideal human might look like and really contemplate on what that ideal human might look like, right? Because the half that Rama has are more of what we might call the virtuous qualities. And then Krishna has those virtuous qualities with maybe what from a judgmental person, not a discerning perspective, but from a judgmental perspective, we might consider non-virtuous, um, right? but we have to look at it in a much bigger picture when we try to judge what is virtuous and what is non-virtuous. But I think we need to wrestle with that a little bit today. So I'd like just to try that a little in a little bit. Um, and as I've already mentioned, Rama Navami is the birthday and the marriage day. And that's why I put both of these pictures here because I don't have any pictures of baby Rama. <laughs> so that's not really a huge part of his story. Um, so again, he exemplified this perfect person he was the embodiment of compassion and gentleness and kindness and righteousness and integrity. And that's those half aspects of Vishnu that are so wonderful, right? This sustaining aspect of Vishnu. These are what Rama really embodied. Um, he had all the power in the world, but he was still peaceful and gentle. He was so peaceful and gentle that Hanuman, who had the ability to grow to the size of a mountain and shrink to the size of a flea, who could you know, carry a mountain and leap oceans, right? That that being bowed down to him and, and devoted himself to Rama. So there must be something very special if a, if a being like Hanuman could devote himself, right? Wholeheartedly with all of his essence to Rama, there must be something special there. Um, the word Rama literally means one who is divinely blissful and who gives joy to others. Um, and, and like I was saying before, really the focus here is he is considered to be the incarnation of Vishnu, which is the epitome of Dharma. Now in this picture, you'll see on his helmet, the sun. And we're gonna get into that a little bit, right? Because there's a huge aspect to Rama that has to do with a solar dynasty, the solar plexus, the third chakra, 
right? We're going to touch on that, but I wanted to kind of bring that to your attention now because I have to go so quickly. But when we are looking, and, and this is what I was teaching earlier, when we look at murtis, which are statues, you know, of, of, of Vedic gods, right? Um, when we look at these pictures, these pictures are based on ancient stories and they are following a pattern, right? Each one of these pictures typically has to incorporate, the, the artist wants to incorporate certain things that are, you know, important. And this is one of those that's very, very important when we think about Rama is this solar aspect. So now we're going to do a little intermission. Now I want to take a little break from all of this talk about Vishnu all of this talk about perfect human being, all of this talk about Rama and where Rama fits into these incarnations of Vishnu. And I want to do just not even 10 minutes, right? It's a total of six minutes of listening to stuff, but I want to have a conversation. I actually want to get people to, to unmute and share after we listen and contemplate for a couple of minutes. So the first thing that I want to do is we're going to listen to Krishna Das sing Sri Ram, Jai Ram, Jai Jai Ram, right? I would appreciate it if you did one of two things. Close your eyes and just listen and think about what it means to you personally to be, to, what are the properties of a perfect human being? What, how would you describe that? How would you want to live that, right? That's one way to approach the next three minutes. Another way, if that's not comfortable for you, is I've kind of put a couple of pictures that'll start to appear, artist renditions of some of the stories of Rama, some pictures of him, those kinds of things, that that might also visually trigger something inside of you, but always being thinking about the, the perfect human, right? The best qualities, because again, that's what Rama really is. And that's why when we're thinking about Rama avatar, in my opinion, right? I'm presenting saying that's what we should be thinking about, okay? So let's go ahead and um, get started just listening and either with your eyes closed or just by looking at the screen, the perfect human.
So for anybody that would like to share, on the screen right now is a picture of Ram and Sita and his three brothers and Hanuman. One of those brothers accompanied Ram on his 14 year exile. One of those brothers whose mother was so treacherous to, to give him the, convince the, the king to give him the throne. He is there as well. And he did not want that throne. And he went out and ran out of the, the kingdom to go ahead and follow Ram and said, this is not right. You and all of the brothers really said, this is not right. You shouldn't do it, right? And Ram said, I must respect my father, right? That is my dharma. And so Bharat, his younger brother said, okay, please allow me to take your shoes. He took his shoes and put them on his head and he walked back into the kingdom and he placed those shoes down by the throne and said, I am only here to hold this kingdom in your stead. This is your kingdom. So there are so many beautiful stories about his brothers that we really don't get into when we talk about Ram, right? And then you've got Hanuman here and his devotion. So if anybody is willing to share, if we could take a couple minutes and just kind of throw out, how would we describe a perfect human? Fearless. Someone with complete courage and trust and faith in their own dharma. Uh, I, I, I think of a person who, who keeps their word no matter what. The question of that consistency and devotion to obeying something that was laid out to him in spite of what it would imply. Thank you. Any other ideas? Monica. There we go. Um, I, I think it's uh, um, an ideal person is, uh, first of all, receptive to the higher forces within his own being and uh, therefore um, <coughs> able to recognize that in others and makes decisions out of that receptivity uh, coupled with compassion for the faults of others and his own faults, whatever they may be. So I think what I'm uh, ultimately pointing to is a balance of these different elements that make up a human being that have to include his divine self, his glorious higher self, and that willingness to allow the human aspect of himself to be what it is and to forgive it and to have compassion for it and allow it to develop through that compassion. Thank you. Ken? Uh, yes, I would say, again, on, on the balance thing, it's uh, kind of to a different, a different story of the good wolf and the bad wolf, you know, that we have these kind of opposing forces with us. You might say the divine upper self and then the lower egoic uh, kind of, you know, jealous, violent self. And, and that to balance those and then also to put more attention as a striving and a goal on the um, uh, on the more compassionate and divine and, and helpful things that we can do moving in that bodhisattva direction. So for me, the perfect human would recognize that complexity within us and then make the choice to go in the more compassionate direction. Thank you. I can't see if there's anybody else, um, but I, I looked at the time. So if there's somebody that wants to share something important, that'd be great. Otherwise, I got a lot. <laughs> I still got a lot to get through. <laughs> One more thing, Kurt. Is that it's all right? Yeah. Um, somebody yeah. releases the divine potential in those around him, as did Rama, it seems like. I mean, he worked with pretty motley crews sometimes with the monkeys and the bears and so forth. But he also quickened the higher self, like in his 
just by his own exemplariness that his older brother or, or the other brother of Arta uh, released such a, a genius of um, duty within, within, when the, within all of those around, actually releases the genius of duty within those around him. That's how I'd sum all that up. Yeah, there's the, the story of Lakshmana, like I was saying, um, you know, he's really upset that Rama is going along with this order. And so he's angry, like, like very angry. And, and it's, and it's Rama that has to kind of calm him down in a sense. He's, you know, we can, we can make a sort of a, an equation of Lakshmana is Arjuna, Rama becomes Krishna and has to really kind of calm him down and get him to think about this in a much bigger, much bigger way, broader way. So thank you for sharing everybody. Um, so the next thing that I want to go through is this idea of mantra. And I don't know how many people are familiar with this idea of mantra, but this is, again, these are Vedic principles that are very ancient, right? These are sounds, these are intentions, right? That are very ancient and they can be very powerful. And there's some that are specific, you know, specific to various deities. But since we're talking about Rama, I thought I would share one specific mantra that, um, that you can do because it incorporates so much, encapsulates so much of what I've already kind of touched on briefly in how to um, really embrace what, what and why Rama avatar is so important, right? So Ram is the seed sound of the Manipura, the third solar plexus chakra. And as I said before, Rama and the, and the king were, were from the solar dynasty, right? They were considered a solar dynasty. And so now you've got Ram being a seed sound of the solar plexus. This is the power in this chakra um, is the internal sun and life force in this chakra. It's where our energy and our will and our mastery come from. When the third chakra is strong and balanced, we radiate compassion and dexterity and warmth, right? And all of these aspects that we've been just sharing with each other, this is where these, these traits come from in this third chakra, right? Um, if it is deficient, then we have the other aspects that we would say are probably not as pure, which is controlling and dominating and never being able to rest, right? We, we've got the gunas and Thomas is always kind of looked at as the, the bad guna, right? Because it is the, the lower one, but we need Thomas, we have to rest, we need naps and we need sleep, right? And that is a tamasic property. Right. But at the same time, so we need to be able to to not be active. Right. But if we're constantly active, that's a sign of a deficient third chakra. Right. Likewise, if you're feeling weak or passive or tired, you're not fulfilling your dharma if you're just sitting home depressed. Right. That's clearly not your dharma. So that also is a sign of a of a debilitated third chakra. And so chanting this specific mantra, the Apadamapa mantra is one of those things that can help balance that, right? Um, when we go into a more metaphysical aspect to this mantra and to Rama, right? Ra is associated with the solar current that runs down the right side of the body. Ma is associated with the lunar current that runs down the left side of the body. And so when these, criss when these currents crisscross, that is said to be the action that actually spins the chakras. So by chanting mantras to Ram, we are engaging all of our chakras, but specifically the third Manipura chakra, right? So it's, it's a multiple benefit, right? And so one of the things that I would like to show now is just a, a gentleman that I came across on YouTube. I have his contact information there and I'll put it, when we post this online, I'll just show you who this person is in case it's somebody that you resonate with. Um, he puts up lots of different mantras and some, some Vedanta teachings, right? Um, he's a Canadian, so I like him because I like my Canucks. You know, I, I, uh, being a former hockey player, I've hung out with a lot of Canadian guys. So I love the accent, man. I just love the Canadian accent. And so when I hear a guy chanting mantras, it just geeks me out. But uh, all I'm going to do is have him chant this mantra nine times. Now, he's going to go through and, and talk about, I, I basically took his video and I cut it up into little chunks so that it's only three minutes long again. But I want to kind of get those of us that aren't familiar with mantras to understand why we should do them, how we might briefly do them, and what the benefit of them could be, right? So I will go ahead and play this now. And in the middle of it, um, I will show what this mantra actually means, what the Sanskrit that he is chanting. And I only have the transliteration up here, but I'll show kind of what 
is being chanted so you can understand really what is happening during the mantra. Today I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, a mantra that's really powerful in healing. Uh, it is a Rama mantra. And according to the Vedas and then various stories written about Rama is that any of his mantras are the best at reducing karma or alleviating karma altogether. There's a very, very powerful mantra that is worth learning if you have health conditions or problems. I've also been told that this mantra is very good for nervous system disorders, anything to do with the nervous system, brain, uh, nerves, you know, and so forth. Uh, it's called uh, the Apadamapa Mantra, um, 108 times in the morning, 108 times at night. And if you do this for 40 days, I guarantee you will experience some result, some type of healing in your life. It might not be the type of healing that you're looking for at that exact moment, but it will definitely be something that will increase your quality of life. So uh, this is a very, very powerful mantra. And uh, it does deal a lot with the third chakra because rama has a lot to do with the third chakra as far as light and healing and that's where a lot of our karma is it seems like the third chakras are our identity you know where our uh, our identification in this incarnation exists it's the apadamapa mantra it's one of my favorite mantras and i'm sure after you hear it you'll probably agree om apadamapa hattaram dattaram sarva sampadam Loka bi ramam shri ramam boyo boyo namam yaham. Om apadamapa hattaram dattaram sarva sampadam. Loka bi ramam shri ramam boyo boyo namam yaham. Om apadamapa hattaram dattaram sarva sampadam. Loka bi ramam shri ramam boyo boyo namam yaham. Om apadamapa hattaram dattaram sarva sampadam loka bi ramam shri ramam boyo boyo namam yaham Om apadamapa hattaram dattaram sarva sampadam loka bi ramam shri ramam boyo boyo namam yaham Om apadamapa hattaram dattaram sarva sampadam Loka bi ramam shri ramam boyo boyo namam yaham. Om apadamapa hattaram dattaram sarva sampadam. Loka bi ramam shri ramam boyo boyo namam yaham. Om apadamapa hattaram dattaram sarva sampadam. Loka bi ramam shri ramam boyo boyo namam yaham. Om apadamapa hattaram dattaram sarva sampadam loka bi ramam shri ramam boyo boyo namam yaham So to chant that 108 times probably would take around 30 40 minutes right um, to go ahead and go through that in his specific video I think he only actually does it for 25 I think times um, there's lots of stuff that's available now. I mean, the, the internet is amazing. You can actually find, I'm sure, versions of that specific mantra where they actually do it 108 times and with some way of reading it on the screen so that you don't have to just try to memorize it, or, you know, or write it down or whatever. But, you know, ultimately, um, for those that aren't familiar with mantra at all, I wanted to kind of give some type of guide of, of the benefits of these types of practices. So here I am with basically 15 minutes left and I'm only on part two. So if you got somewhere to go, <laughs> I'm sorry, this will be recorded and put up on, on our YouTube channel later. Um, but in part two, I want to get into these four aims of human life. Now in our Gita class on Friday, we talked about stages. And so I put those in afterwards. I just put those in on this slide here because that's what we were talking about in the Gita class on Friday. But realistically, when we're talking about Dharma, that goes into an aim of life, like what we're really doing when we're here, right? So I wanted to show, with, if we start with just the little box of stages, you can see on this image, the big colorful image, Artha at the bottom, Kama above that, Dharma above that, and Moksha above that. So then with the stages, I kind of started base layer of 
this brahmacharya, this student idea, right? As kind of the underpinning, the, the foundation for the other ones. Then as we move on with stages, we go into a householder status, the grihasta, then we go into the vanaprastha, this retirement stage. And then finally, this sannyasa renunciation. Those are the stages, right, of life that we go through. But realistically, the brahmacharya stage, we never go through. Look at us, right? I mean, mo the people that I can see on my screen, right, have gone through the student stage. We're in the householder stage, at least. Some of us are in the retirement stage, right? And yet we're still in the student stage. We're all still here trying to learn, right? So this appears to be one of those, those things that kind of just keeps going, right? Now, the, and the reason that I bring that up is, can somebody admit, there's an admit person here on my screen, I can't find my mouse. Um, so in this image, there's, there's a, a way in looking at these aims of life um, that are a bit different because artha and kama, artha being security, material gains, you know, those kinds of things, kama being desire and pleasure, right? Those are like a lower sense. And on this picture, and so it's hard to, to really visualize this really appropriately, I think, you know, because it's showing almost like these steps going up towards moksha, but realistically, artha and kama need to have an underlying foundation of dharma so that you get out of the lower aspects of artha and kama, right? And get into a higher aspect of artha and kama. And the only way you do that is through dharma. But at the same time, those three aspects are considered lower compared to the fourth, which is moksha, right? This liberation idea. And so, this, these are those paradoxes that we often get, right, in theosophy, which is, it tells us to go left, but we need to go right, and it tells us to go right, and we need to go left, and now we don't know which way to go, right, so just keep going straight, just keep going forward, who cares, you know, that kind of thing. This is those same kinds of essences, right, but I want to start to show that dharma is what Rama is all about, but to really understand dharma, we have to understand its place in the other aims, right, it is a higher aspect of karma and artha, right, of desire and, and um, security and of money and financial resources and those kinds of things, right? Um, but at the same time, that's still going to guide you through these aims. Those are still aspects, whether, you know, you're following your dharma or not, that's there. So, oh, now we go again. Here we go. So now we're going to get into some theosophy for the theosophy geeks out there. We're going to actually start to read what HBB has in her collected writings. Um, we're going to go into um, Sri Madhava Ashish, right? We're going to talk about him briefly. So we're really going to get some theosophical ideas here. Now, this first quote I found was amazing um, because the name is Vishnu Bhava, right? I mean, how great can it be? We're starting off talking about Rama and Vishnu, and then we've got a quote about Dharma from a man named Vishnu Bhava, right? The love of Vishnu, you know? Um, so he says, Dharma radically means duty and nature. Dharma is the duty and the nature coexistent with the very living existence of a being in the universe, of a being in the universe, right? That's how he's defining it. But then HPB in her wonderful way comes in and says, eh, I need to go ahead and correct that a little bit, right? Let me go ahead and make sure we really understand this. So she says property would be the better word as duty is that which a person is bound by any natural, moral, or legal obligation to do or refrain from doing and cannot be applied but to intelligent and reasoning beings. And the quote, the example she gives is, fire will burn and cannot refrain from doing it. So it's not fire's duty, right, in that sense. That's why she's saying it's a property. And from a theosophical perspective, this is the best way to look at it. Right? We need to look at these things as universal properties and universal um, principles, right? rather than trying to solidify them in matter. However, we are in this world and in this universe, and so we can look at these things from the being perspective. Right. So even though she clarifies him, and I will say that in her collected writings, I didn't put it on here on the quotes, but she says Vishnu Baba was a saint. Right? She absolutely adored this man, and so even though she corrected this idea of Dharma, she still respects him immensely, right? Um, and as usual, you know, when I'm showing my screen here, I can't, um, 
I, I can't see the whole right side edge because I've got pictures there. So just bear with me if I mispronounce something that comes on the right hand part of the screen here. But Vishnu Baba continues and he says, the highest, the best, the most beneficial, the omnipresent, omnipresent religion of Dharma of a rational being, rational being again, is not only to know, but also to experience personally, i.e. to feel this unconscious immateriality or paramatma, the infinity and eternity of existence and happiness. So he's defining dharma as self-realization. He's defining dharma as not duty, not nature specifically, right? He's talking about this essence of unconscious immateriality to find paramatma, to find the atma, to find this self, the true capital S self of all. He continues, this state of unconscious immateriality is the true or eternal state of being. For saving it, there can be found no other true existence. Therefore, every rational being's dharma or natural duty and religion is first to acquire the knowledge of its real self, the paramatma, and then by the annihilation of atma or worldly self or soul, to experience the infinity of happiness pre-something in its unconscious immateriality. So again, he's trying to say this first definition of dharma is self-realization. You need to experience it. You don't think about it. You don't talk about it. You don't philosophize about it, right? This is the personal experience because then you go through the annihilation of the lower atma, the lower egoic self, the lower soul, right? Animal, however we want to define that. And now again, I'm taking us on a journey. So now we're going to go to DT Suzuki in his manual of Zen Buddhism. And as I mentioned in the beginning, Buddha is the ninth avatar of Vishnu. And so now we're going to start playing with Rama and Buddha and Dharma. So here, these, these little things that I have coming up are just little things to meditate upon, right? So the threefold refuge, I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Buddha, the incomparably honored one. I take refuge in the Dharma, honorable for its purity. I take refuge in the Sangha, honorable for its harmonious life. I have finished taking refuge in the Buddha. I have finished taking refuge in the Dharma. I have finished taking refuge in the Sangha. Sangha is kind of community, right? That's why it says honorable for its harmonious life. Going back to Jonathan's thing earlier of the perfect human kind of bringing everybody together and getting everybody to follow their path and teaching and those kinds of things, right? That is this notion of Sangha. And so, you know, now we're looking at emulating the Buddha living the purity of the Dharma, and then in doing that, recognizing the importance of the community, right? And what is theosophy but universal brotherhood? So this quote of Zen Buddhism really speaks theosophy so much, right? Without even recognizing that it's theosophical in any way. So now going on to Sri Madhava Ashish, I have a huge thing for Krishna Prem and Mahava Ashish. I adore their writings. Um, I, I think I, at this point, own everything that they've ever put out um, in various forms, including the, from their students, right? The kind of autobot or the biographies of them and those kinds of things. So they're people that I go to when I want to say, I want to say something different. Let me see what they had to say about these things. So um, Sri Madhava Ashish, this was written after Krishna Prem kind of had passed away, his, his mentor and his teacher, right? Um, so this is the teachings that he was given and then him putting them back out there. And I believe this book is an actual theosophical published book, right? Like from the Theosophical Publishing House. He says, what we believe about our origin determines what we believe about our destiny. And both of these determine our attitudes towards everyday life, our personal and social ethic or dharma. So now there's a little bit of a different twist on what Dharma means. There's no right or wrong answer per se, if it's a property, right? Now we're talking about what rational beings do to live it. But now we're talking about our origins and our destiny and how we put this into, into practice, as Jonathan had said. 
the prehistorically founded religions or Sanatana Dharma would invariably associated with some sort of creation myth, which in effect, an affirmation of the divine nature of all things, an aff affirmation that gave significance to human life and validity to the social codes formulated on the pattern of what it was believed man should be, or rather what he should become. And how have we described Rama so far? Rama is not mentioned in Sri Madhava Ashish. In Man, Son of Man, he's talking about the secret doctrine. These books are going over the, um, the stanzas, right? These, these texts that he and Krishna Prem had put together are talking about the stanzas in the secret doctrine. And yet they're talking about Rama. They're talking about this perfected man, right? And what society should look like filled with these types of people. Continuing on, most of us have lost touch with the traditional sense of the invisible yet ordered pattern. Again, now it's Dharma is an invisible yet ordered pattern underlying the apparently random events of the sense world. So he's brought in a whole nother definition that we can think of when we think of Dharma. We live in a world society which has lost faith in the identity that, or in the idea that human life is based on the eternal and that human aims are valid only in so far as they support the evolutionary purpose. The human aims, as I talked about before, are artha, kama, dharma, moksha. So if those, those aims are valid only in so far as they support the evolutionary purpose. And what is the evolutionary purpose according to Vishnu Bhava? Self-realization, right? Self-realization. So again, going back to DT Suzuki and Zen Buddhism, the four great vows, however innumerable beings are, I vow to save them. However inexhaustible the passions are, I vow to extinguish them. However immeasurable the dharmas are, I vow to master them. However incomparable the Buddha truth is, I vow to attain it. And in this, it speaks the aims that I was just talking about. Artha, Kama, Dharma, Moksha, it's all there, but from a completely different lineage, right? Um, and again, talking about the Buddha and incarnation of Vishnu. So continuing on with some of HPB's collected writings, she writes, and this was an interesting one too in researching this because this is from Theosophy and Buddhism. And it was originally, I guess, printed in French or um, put in Lucifer and translated into French or something along those lines. But it says, now, as to the Dharma, and this is specifically related to the Dharma of theosophy, right? Theosophy has to do with something else than just rules of conduct. It achieves the miracle of uniting the pre-Buddhistic ethics with pre-Vedic metaphysics and pre-Hermetic science. Theosophical development calls upon all the principles of man, upon his intellectual as well as spiritual faculties. This is Dharma from a theosoph theosophy perspective, what it is to be a theosophist, right? So now self-realization we have with Vishnu Bhava and we've got our, where we come from and where we're going from Madha, Sri Madhava Ashish. And now we've got HPB basically writing all of these things that we study as theosophists ultimately end up that it's about our intellectual and spiritual faculties. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to put the meditation and the mantra in there, right, as this little intermission phase, is I wanted to kind of get some of us, and me included, right, to really start to focus on there's more than just the intellectual part, right? We have to get to this spiritual part and this self-realization part, as Susan and many others were talking about in the Gita class, meditation, how we handle that practice, right? What, what our intentions are, the actual practical aspects. These are things that we all need to be working on to really achieve what it is to be a theosophist and to live that dharma. And so we're gonna be transitioning from the word dharma to duty here in a bit, but I wanted to go ahead and quote something from Judge in his Echoes of the Orient. It is the aim of the TS to bring to the notice of those who are inclined to admit the spiritual nature of man and his progressive evolution. 
that on another plane of existence, a plane which partakes of a wider field of consciousness and which lies within the capability of development in every individual, that on that higher plane, there is a spiritual unity, a universal brotherhood of mankind. And on that plane of being, there is no separateness. That man's true duty at all times and in all circumstances is the love of his kind and the preservation of harmony around him. What did we talk about in the perfect man? The perfect human, I apologize. The perfect human, right? That's what we talked about. The ideas that we threw out, we're talking about the duty that in all circumstances to love and to preserve harmony, right? That's what we talked about. And that's what really Ram was doing. That's what Jonathan had mentioned, right? Is that aspect of Ram. So now part three, thanks for bearing with me. We're getting, we're getting down to the end. It's only a three-parter. <laughs> so now we're going to talk about duty. Now this image right here is what I was just talking about for two hours today. This is something that Manoj and I have been working on for quite some time, which is trying to put Carl Jung and Joseph Campbell and Vedanta and Murtis and, and Yugas and all this stuff into one idea, right? So there's a lot going on on this slide. Um, you can see that we've got Kali Yuga in the first, the first area, the first box in the upper right. Then we go to Dwapara Yuga in the second one. We've got Treta Yuga, we've got uh, Satya Yuga. In Kali, what, what we look at in, if we go now backwards, in Satya Yuga, there are no demons, they're vanquished, right? This is that perfect idea of what, what all of us should look like. We have no demons anywhere. In Treta Yuga, the demons are around us in society. They're, they're, um, they're not blood related to us, right? In Dwapara Yuga, the demons are in our family. It's getting closer, right? The demons are now not vanquished and they're not just around us floating around in society. Now they're coming into our bloodline. They're in our, in our family, right? And in Kali Yuga, the demons are us, right? They're within us. They're hiding inside our, what do we call it? The seven deadly sins, right? It is our shadow, right? And that's why then if you look at down the middle, you've got persona, ego, shadow, anima, animus, and self. These are Carl Jung's individuation stages, right? And they, I have them going down, but that's only to imply going in, right? It's, it's in, I wanted to really think of it as when we are looking out at the world and we're going through that, we see persona, right? We, we see our persona projected, right? We're, our eyeballs are actually like projectors in a movie theater, projecting out persona, and then they're projecting out ego. And in that's the personal conscious. You can kind of see the way I labeled that above that line. That's our personal conscious area. We're aware of those things, right? Then when we go into the unconscious, but it's still personal, that's our shadow self. That's, I, I'm, I'm a hypocrite. I'm selfish. You know, I do those things. I accuse people of doing what I do and I judge them for it. I'm not saying I do it all the time, but I do it, right? That's the shadow side, right? That we're just, again, movie screen projecting out. But as we go deeper into the collective unconscious, this is this universal principle now, right? That the anima and the animus hide in this universal principle. We all have a masculine energy. We all have a feminine aspect, right? Universally, we have that. Whatever our sex or gender is, we still have anima and animus. And the self here, really Carl Jung wasn't specifically stating the, the one self, but that's what he was getting at, right? And that's why I'm saying I wanted to kind of picture this, even with the colors that I used is, we're looking at the chakras in kind of a reverse order of red, you know, orange, yellow, green would have been in that middle point, the heart space, right? And then kind of elevating through these, these rays, these colors, right? So this is what I talk about um, with, with Manoj and what I was dealing with today. The big numbers where it says one call to adventure, two challenges and temptations, then there's a turning point revelation there at the very bottom, and then three, transformation and atonement, and four, return. This is Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, right? And the reason that I'm showing you all of this now, right, is because that's who I'm going to be quoting from next when it comes to duty is Carl Jung and Joseph Campbell. Um, and so I wanted to kind of give you a sense of why these two teachers who wouldn't call themselves theosophists are important, right? Why this is, I'm, why what I'm presenting is valuable is because if I look at, if I can show you how the yuga cycles can relate to 
Jung's individuation, can relate to Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, can relate to Rahm's journey, maybe then all of this can be tied together in some kind of a, a cohesive way. So from Carl Jung's Undiscovered Self, he talks about duty. And again, these aren't gonna, these aren't, a lot of this before I get really into it is his, he talks about, it's called the undiscovered self. These are reflections for him, right? The, uh, in a sense, like a diary, but they're universal in nature, right? So what he says is anyone who has once learned to submit absolutely to a collective belief and to renounce his eternal right to freedom and the equally eternal duty of individual responsibility will persist in this attitude and will be able to set out with the same credulity and the same lack of criticism in the reverse direction if another and manifest, quote, better, close quote, belief is foisted upon his alleged idealism. So what Carl Jung is saying is if you are not living in a space of having a duty to maintain individual responsibility for everything, right, and a space of an eternal right to freedom, if you don't embody that and live it every single day, then your belief structure will be like a leaf on the wind. It'll just keep blowing from idea to idea to concept to concept. You have no grounding, right? Without this idea of duty, of dharma, right? So I wanted to go ahead and kind of point out, this is how an analytical psychologist looks at duty as if you don't have these principles really inside you, if you renounce them, if you give them up, right? If you give your personal responsibility, your individual responsibility to somebody else and allow them to dictate how you're going to live your life, right? You will be blown around like crazy. In the spiritual problem of modern man, again, now he's going to go through some kind of personal ideas, right? The revolution in our conscious outlook brought about by the catastrophic results of the world war shows itself in our inner life by the shattering of our faith in ourselves and our own worth. We use to regard foreigners as political and moral reprobates. But the modern man is forced to recognize, forced to recognize that he is politically and morally just like anybody else. And then this is the important part. Whereas formerly I believed it was my bounden duty to call to order, to call others to order, I must now admit that I need calling to order myself. And then I would do better to set my own house to rights first, right? So this is, this is him on his journey of this shadow idea, right? Instead of telling other people how to live their lives, right? I really need to focus on me. I gotta, I gotta get my, you know what together, right? That's really what he's trying to say here, but it's a bounden duty to go in, to go on that individuation process, to recognize the persona and the ego and the shadow. And there's other, um, archetypes. He has something called the wise elder that kind of lies between the shadow and the anima and the animus, right? So as we recognize the shadow, then we start to realize that, hey, there's something universal about where wisdom comes from, right? And that then leads you to this notion of, well, we're all really the same underneath kind of thing. So the last quote from Carl Jung, back to the undiscovered self, um, and just as the typical neurotic is unconscious of his shadow side, so the normal individual, like the neurotic, sees his shadow in his neighbor or in the man beyond the great divide. So again, <laughs> less, don't judge others lest you be judged or whatever, that idea, right? Don't say that the neurotic out there is not aware of it because as soon as you say that, you've just projected your own neuroses on that neurotic, right? So be careful of that. Um, and in the last quote here, it has even become a political and social duty to apostrophize the capitalism of the one and the communism of the other as the very devil. So as to fascinate the outward eye and prevent it from looking at the individual life within. And I'm going to apologize right now, but look at the world we live in, folks, right? How much of that do we see on a daily basis on the news and in our Facebooks and whatever messages we share on whatever our social media stuff is, is this idea right now. I'm bombarded with it personally, right? With the idea of 
which system of economics is better and which system of politics is better and which system of whatever is better, right? And all of it is a distraction because it's, it's keeping all of us from looking at the individual life within and recognizing if we're gonna really individuate, you're not gonna find it out outside of you, right? So now we're gonna go to, again, back to um, Suzuki. And this is gonna focus on Kwanan, which is Kuan Yin, right? I know a lot of us love Kuan Yin. And this is the 10 Clause Sutra. Adoration to Kuan Yin, adoration to the Buddha. To the Buddha, we are related in terms of cause and effect. Depending on the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Nirvana is possible, which is eternal, ever blessed, autonomous, and free from defilement. Every morning our thoughts are on Kuan Yin. Every evening our thoughts are on Kuan Yin. Every thought issues from the mind. Every thought is not separated from the mind. Unity. There is no separation, even in thought and even in mind. And again, we're talking about Buddha and Dharma and Sangha, this idea of the perfected human and incarnation of Vishnu and our purpose and our duty and our nature and the way in which everything is supposed to function as it is and where we lie in that with the community that surrounds us. And so then bringing in Joseph Campbell on Dharma and surrender, and this is where I bring in Isabel from last week. You like how I did that? <laughs> so now we're going to talk about surrender a bit. There is, in fact, in such a world, no such thing as an individual life, but only one great cosmic law by which all things are governed in their places. In Egyptian, this law was known as Mat. In Sumerian, as Me or Me. In Chinese, it is Tao. In Sanskrit, Dharma. There is to be no individual choosing, willing, or even thinking. No occasion to pause for oneself. What is it I would now most like to do? What is it I would like to be? Rama never thinks that. He never thinks what is it I would most like to do. He never thinks what it is I would most like to be. He just bees, right? He just is. He just does what shows up in front of him. One's birth determines what one is to be as well as what one is to think and to do. Didn't Madhiva Ashish say the same thing? Where we come from is important in understanding what our Dharma is. And now Joseph Campbell is saying the same thing. And the great point that I most want to bring out is that this early Bronze Age something, con, all I can see is C-O-N-C, con something, a socially, constitutes maybe, a socially manifest cosmic order to which every individual must uncritically submit surrender is to be anything at all is fundamental in the orient one way or the other to this i don't know what that last word is there i apologize this is this is the tough part can somebody can somebody finish reading that for me okay. to day yeah to thank this you. day mm -hmm. to this day so again this is joseph campbell now like basically tying it all up in a pretty little bow for us right now Relating back to the four aims of life, which started part two, I think, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, he goes on and he says, the philosophies of India have been classified into four categories according to the ends of life that they serve, the four aims for which men strive in this world. The first and second are of a nature and are of the aims to which all living things are naturally impelled success or achievement, self-aggrandizement, which is in Sanskrit, artha, and sensual delight or pleasure, which is kama. These, these two correspond to the aims of what Freud has called the id. And I love this aspect of this quote, right? Because now we're bringing Freud into this equation. Freud calls the id, the natural artha and kama, right? These are part of that. Then we say they are the expressions of the primary biological motives of the psyche. The simple I want of one's animal nature. I want, Artha and Kama, I want, right? Did, did Rama express those aspects? 
In the Ramayana, no, he did not. He did not express the I wants. His brothers did. His wife did. His wife, you know, she got kidnapped by Ravana because she wanted this golden deer that was prancing around. And Lakshmana said, I don't think you want that. That's probably a demon. And she's like, nope, I want it. And he's like, I don't think you want that. It's probably a demon. And she said, dang it, I want that. And so then Lakshmana and, and Rama ended up going after this golden thing. So we have these I wants, right? The third is Dharma, duty or virtue which is defined for each by his place in the social order, Sangha. The principle of Dharma impressed on each by his society corresponds to what Freud has called superego, the cultural thou shalt, right? So now we've got the superego and thou shalt. I want of Atma and Kama and thou shalt of Dharma. And again, when you think about Ram, that's where he was really living his life. He was a, before he was king and had to kind of send Sita away because of his people, he was a husband. Before that, he was a son. You see what I mean? He was, he was living that, that stage of, of life, right? And living it completely. And Joseph Campbell is talking about it. In the Indian society, one's pleasures and successes are to be aimed for and achieved under the ceiling, so to say, of one's dharma. Thou shalt supervising the I want. And I loved that, that idea, right? That the thou shalt is the one in charge, right, of all of the I wants. And then when midlife has been attained, when all the duties of life fulfilled, one departs, if a male, and again, he's going through the way in which it used to be done in the old days, right? One departs for the forest to some hermitage ashram to wipe out through yoga union with the divine, every last least trace of I want. And with that, every echo also of thou shalt. So this moksha idea is you get rid of the I want. And even if it's being supervised by the thou shalt, you gotta get rid of that too. Everything has to go even the echo of it, even when it's not even there and it's just a glimmer, just a whisper, just the faintest of thou shalt needs to go. Whereupon the fourth goal, the fourth and final aim of life will have been attained, which is known as moksha, absolute release or freedom, but not freedom like we think of it in the West, the freedom of an individual to be what he wants to be or to do what he wants to do. That was not what Rama did. He didn't live that. On the contrary, Freedom in the sense of moksha means freedom from every impulse to exist. I love Joseph Campbell. I love mm -hmm. him. So this last piece I brought up a little bit in our Gita class, right? And that is the idea of the Tathagata, right? The Buddha would often refer to himself in this kind of third person as the Tathagata. So instead of saying I, me, those kinds of things, it was the Tathagata, with like some rice, right? That kind of a deal, right? But what that means is depending on how you take tat or tata and gata or agata, depending on how you separate that word means different things, right? It is one who has gone or one who thus has gone, right? One who has come or one who has not gone. Mm -hmm. So when you think about that, I try to summarize that as to say, this is beyond all coming and going. And this is really what the moksha is. This is really what liberation is beyond any more coming and going, right? And so I, I basically put this quote in there because I just wanted to wrap it all up with, the Dharma is incomparably profound and exquisite, is rarely met with, even in hundreds of thousands of millions of kalpas. But we are now permitted to see it, to listen to it, to accept and hold it. May we truly understand the meaning of the Tathagata's words. And so with that, because I am not beyond coming and going, until next time, <laughs> we have next week from Puck to Prospero. So for those Shakespeare geeks out there, you're going to hopefully and really enjoy this one. This is a picture right here of Prospero disarming I don't know who the other character is here, but he did it with a stick, right? Basically he took a stick and, and disarmed the guy with a sword. 
Um, but this, this quote on here is the one from the Aquarian Almanac. The disciples' sojourn on earth should be a compassionate mode of wise participation in the lives of others through the empathetic recognition of illusions and, the alchemical trans and their alchemical transmutation. And I just thought this was that looking backward and looking forward. I really tried to take us to this compassionate mode of wise participation. That is why we study Rama Avatar. That is why, right? Because he embodied that idea right there that is gonna be explored even further when we talk about Shakespeare's writings and, and the character of Puck and the character of Prospero and wherever else this goes. Um, and so I really appreciate you, you know, hanging in there. I know I went long. Um, I will be back on June 5th when I present on reincarnation and silence. And I have no idea how that's going to go yet. So <laughs> all I know is the title. So if there's any questions or comments, thank you for listening. And now is the time to share. Kurt, um, thank you very much. We're pretty much out of time, but um, okay. I just wanted to say um, thank you for um, first of all, what you said about Rama and the next week's thing about um, participating empathetically in the lives of others and all these different um, archetypes that Rama exemplified. I, I was thinking about that the whole time, the connection between this presentation and next week's presentation and that. And then Shakespeare does that. He has so many different uh, windows into uh you know, learning curves and so forth that you know, are in the Shakespearean characters. And also, I really appreciate your, um, your, your connection between duty and individuation. I think you made that loud and clear and so much to think about. Um, for those who wish to stay, why don't we take one question? Or is everybody just so blown away? I wore I'm you out. I'm, I'm, out. I'm, I'm pretty blown away. I have to say this, like, like a, whoa, like a storm. All the, was like, whoa. All the village. Okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just, uh, just, just want to make a comment. It was just unbelievable. Thank you so much. You tried to cover so much, tried to cover so much, and tried to synthesize it, and you did it very well. Thank you. No more comment. Oh, there, I think there was a beautiful um, text here, a chat here, a few of them. And um, here's one from Lily Burton. The perfect human is Bhagavan, the one who possesses the six qualities of best human beings. And Truth Collins says, yes, that's a true friend and teacher. And um, Truth is saying, thank you. It was very informative and well done. So thank you, thank you all for, for attending. And uh, we'll see you next week. And uh, Kurt, oh, thank you. just do the mechanics one more time of how to subscribe, so to speak. It's all in emails that I send, right? Um, they can either click on a link at the bottom for new people. Um, like, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll either get the email that gets sent out and sometimes it does go to spam or some filter, right? Cause I know that mine doesn't typically, depending on the device, the emails that I send don't go to the inbox inbox. It goes to like a promotional inbox in my Gmail or something along those lines. Um, but you know, you just kind of go to, um, the, the links that are in there on the bottom will have the links. And so if you share it with someone that might be interested, just tell them to go towards the bottom part of the email. And there's a link that says, if you want to subscribe, click on this link. It actually just opens up a thing that puts, you just put in your email address and you select which mailing list to go on. And just one more reminder, you can watch these. Uh, we've done six or seven of them now, I think. And they are on um, the Eternal Pilgrim uh, YouTube. Yeah. So you go to YouTube, you type in that little search thing, you type in the Eternal Pilgrims. Look for uh, Judge's face. Look for Judge's face. That's the big clue. Yep. So, all right. Thank you, guys. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.